Good morning, everybody. Thank you for uh, an amazing seven weeks so far. This is our eighth class. I think I said it was our fifth or sixth class last week. So um, anyways, thank you guys for uh, all of your hard work and everything else you've done so far. Um, it's been a lot of fun. And uh, I'm excited for the color class coming up in January. And uh, I was able to get to our Facebook page. I really apologize that I didn't get there earlier um, and give more feedback. I know I got a couple emails that I did not respond to. Um, it's been, uh, well, just like you guys, busy, busy week with Thanksgiving and uh, family and everything else. And um, also trying to get ready for another new gallery. So looks like I'll be getting my eighth gallery <laughs> as well as setting up all those other shows. Um, yeah, I appreciate the applause, but it's truly too many. <laughs> so uh, um, I'll be looking through and figuring out which galleries to keep for the next year and how I'm gonna make that all work. But um, anyways, I got to see everybody's work on the Facebook page, which we'll be jumping over to here in just a bit. And amazing you guys really it's uh been so fun um some of you guys are just painting like crazy other people don't worry you know paint when you have time don't you know don't add pressure don't add guilt to yourself we're painting for fun we're learning for fun we're learning to make painting more fun and so don't beat yourself up if you uh you know didn't have time the last couple of weeks because it is a busy time for all of us and um, yeah, let's go ahead and pop over. So the plan for today is uh, just like the last couple of weeks, I wanna give you guys some feedback on the work that you uh, shared with us on Facebook. If anybody um, would like to add anything, please do that now if you have an opportunity. Otherwise, um, I'm, let's go take a look. So we'll be doing a uh, feedback. Hey, Michelle, look, you made it to the top of the page. Just yeah, <laughs> beautiful Thank painting. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Richard, I wanna start with you. You have been one busy fella. There's so many paintings on here. Um, I'll tell you what, if I saw this painting online and didn't know it was one of my students or by you, I would have absolutely thought this was a Monet painting I hadn't seen before. There is so much beautiful just harmony in this piece. Thank you. Um, yeah, really great. And I uh, also know that you went back and fixed up some of the paintings from before and uh, what a difference. Uh, so that's just so neat. It's, you know, I'm a big proponent of just paint and move on, paint and move on. But sometimes going back and uh, changing and fixing up a painting a little bit, we still learn so much from that. And um, I know that Kat does that a lot. And uh, Rick, you look like you've done that on a number of paintings. And yeah. uh, there's just, it's so fun to present it get a little bit of feedback, get a little bit of distance from it and time. And so we get a cleaner or a clearer vision of what our painting actually looks like. Because if you're anything like me, again, I always joke that my paintings are all the best paintings I've ever done while I'm working on them or just after. And then I get about 15 minutes to a couple of days away from it and I can come back and see it for what it really is and see it a little more clearly. Um, so anyways, uh the lee is it the Lai or the lee river the lee river yeah that was in guilin china very cool um let's go ahead and click on it there blow it up yeah tell us a little bit about this it looks like you've done a couple versions of this is that right uh actually no i've been trying to fix the pre I, so i did a uh uh underpainting and then i went back and did the overpainting, didn't quite look the way I wanted. Uh, it wasn't meant to be impressionistic. I have a photo of, of a guy who I found on Pinterest, which I just figured out how to use it last night. My wife showed me. <laughs> but um, so this was across the street from the hotel we were staying at. 
No, oh, wow. And uh, so I went from, you saw the photograph that had the bamboo thing over the, it was kind of arching over the top of the whole thing, but um, I didn't know if I should use that or not. So I wasn't meant to be impressionistic. It just turned out that way. And why do you think that is? Uh, I don't know. It, the underpainting kind of lent itself to that. So uh, I just kind of went with it. And I, there are a few things I changed, like the mountains on the left there, which are really there. I would lower those. Yeah. Just to push them uh, back a little further. Yeah. So it would make the uh, center mountain more dominant. And then I would soften the edges. It, it seems a little too harsh. I don't know. I mean, it feels nice and soft to me. You can definitely sense a lot of atmosphere in this scene. Mm -hmm. That was kind of one of the things that I was hesitant about the bamboo was that it was so crisp and clear and it could definitely work. And there's so many gorgeous Chinese woodblock prints, you right. know, where they, they use the trees and the branches and foliage as uh, framing devices. Right. And I definitely do that myself. I'm always hesitant when a branch just sticks in from the side. Right. That it looks kind of like somebody's photo bombing you. You know what exactly. I mean? Exactly. That's it what I was afraid kinda, of. Yeah. 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 It just kind of peeks in. So if you did decide to do the bamboo, I would definitely stylize it a little bit or, you know, right. not use it exactly like it looks in the photo. Um, right. Sorry. It would overpower. Know. Yeah, and just draw attention away. Um, this just is so complete in what's going on already. I really like it. Um, it's interesting that you say you didn't mean for it to be an impressionistic painting, because I definitely see impressionistic brushwork in a lot of your paintings. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, it was, what was so strange about it is that if you look at the sky, there's purple, there's violet, there's blue, there's pink. There's everything. I just went crazy. You can see it, you know, like in the upper left, especially there, you can see the blues up there and you can see the purples and the pinks. And Yeah. So let me ask somebody besides yourself. Actually, I'll ask Yvonne. Yvonne, you're able to um, unmute. Why does the sky work so well, even though he's got so very many colors in there? Well, the the sky for me works beautifully in part because the textures you have used match or harmonize with the textures in the rest of the painting also the colors are very closely related between the sky and the landscape um the sky I, I don't really know what words to use. This the sky has a tremendous sense of distance. You you feel the miles and miles and miles of sky, the eternity of sky in this painting. And the landscape, for all of its haziness, has a good solid feel. Nailed it. You basically said everything I would have said. That is right, that the ground feels heavier, it feels grounded, and your sky feels airy and soft and uh, like it's floating. And then the, the reason that you're getting away with having purple, blue, oranges, pinks, all these colors in there, in my opinion, is that you've kept it all within the same value. It's not right. jumping all over the place. So if we did a black and white, you know, or, or just squinting your eyes, looking through your eyelashes, you see that everything holds together so nicely because your values are the same. And that's another reason that I was comparing you to Monet. Um, he, w even within an area with tons of colors over here, look at that, all those colors, you know, right. all the way from a maroon to a, you know, cool blue to a green. And we talk about this in the color class, um, all are within the same value. So again, if we squint our eyes, everything holds together so beautifully because he keeps his values together. So as things get lighter and further back, they, you know, they all stay the same. 
you know, this bright, bright green back here kind of falls apart a tiny bit, but, um, you know, I'm not going to critique Monet too badly. Uh, <laughs> um, oh, I did make a conscious effort. To, yeah, that's this guy that kind of inspired me. I don't know who did it. I can't find out, but, um, you know. That's the, uh, Kevin Corter painting. Oh, okay. I love the sky. It, and you look at it close. At first, it looks like it's the same. And then you look at it closely and there's all these colors, there's purples, there's orange, there's blues, there's greens. And so that's what I wanted to do, keep the values all very tight so that it worked together. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. He is so good at it. Um, I actually have a video uh, of his where he talks about that and he basically um he does a lot of the same things i do he wipes away he likes to use q-tips and everything and just yeah look at all these colors down in here right um and it definitely this becomes kind of the focal point as well as the lead in um but yeah within this within this sky you know pinks and greens right next to each other grays purples and it shouldn't really work and it wouldn't if in fact he didn't keep his values very right. tight within each area so like how i talked about last week that in the foreground he's using a, a wider value spectrum right he's got the darks right. and the lights and then as he recedes into space if we get into the mid ground here it becomes a mid value painting right, right. and then he gets into a sky and it becomes a high key value painting and everything stays within those values in each area and it's super important and that's one of the great things you really realize when you establish your value structure you know whether it's by doing a black and white or however you choose to do it just mentally and just getting attacking it um by keeping your value structure intact you can play with color so very much right um, and then let's get back to your painting. Um, it's, I mean, you did it. Well, the mountain actually is a tighter value structure than you see right there with those transparent colors. And then again, I only used Indian yellow, ultramarine blue and permanent magenta. I have primary magenta and white, but when you photograph it and it's wet, it makes it look really weird. So that's why you have the splotches in the mountains that sure. you know, see in the previous pictures. Photographing is always tough. Anyways, beautifully done. Thank you, Yvonne, for the feedback on the clouds. That was yeah, thank you. Right. Uh, and you're right, the distance, it really, you, you can feel a sense of distance. Um, yeah, well played. I'm gonna just get over here to recent media. All right. Oh, we got one of Yvonne's paintings next. Anyways, all right. Uh, do you want me to read what you wrote there, or would you like to tell us a little bit about it? Go ahead and read it. It's more succinct. All right. <laughs> After 45 years of painting with a relatively unchanged palette, I find it very hard to make radical changes. The resulting underpainting is just so unfamiliar. What seemed a soft, sweet mix from last week's color mixes now seems acidic and harsh. In this eight inch by 10 inch, my familiar greens would be made up of viridian green and burnt umber and additional colors added, leaning, transparent, or opaque. All right. Well, great. Tell us, uh, is this from one of my references or what scene is this? No, this is purely imaginary. Oh, wow. Um, this, this is using permanent room cad yellow medium and cobalt blue and white and um, you know when we when we did our little color tests our little color charts last week I really liked that that mix but I don't like painting with it except for the sky I do like the sky <laughs> it's interesting to me because to me it reads really beautifully I'm Isn't I mean it? yeah I don't I Maybe the, the greens are a little bit acidic, but they feel naturalistic and nice and everything ties in. It feels warm. I can sense the light coming across and picking up on things here. And 
Yeah, I don't know. I, I like those, but maybe that it is always a matter of personal preference too. which colors we're comfortable with, which colors we're more used to. Um, do you, uh, from using the same palette uh, for a number of years, do you ever find yourself um, falling back on uh, mixes and things too often? No, I never get tired of that palette. All right. Well, that's great because I sometimes, especially when I put a whole show together and hang it on the wall, I'm like, oh my gosh, they're all so similar. Um, that's true. Yeah, I uh, definitely, but there's also a nice, you know, thing to that because people will often say they can tell one of my paintings simply by the colors, you know, the Indian yellow, and I love the Indian yellow mixed with the uh, quinacridone red to make my peach colors and stuff. Um, so there's times when I challenge myself or I'll just take away a color for a little while if I feel like I've overused it. Um, so anyways, my, I applaud you for experimenting and trying something different. And often when we do try something different, of course, it's awkward and uh, a little bit rough. But um, I, I like these colors personally. Um, but I completely understand. And you're more than welcome to always go back to your comfort zone. I don't want to, you know, push people too much. I want you to enjoy the painting process. I don't want it to hurt at all. Um, but uh, I think it's lovely. Um, you. you you have also kind of an impressionistic brushwork that you do um, throughout the paintings that I've seen of yours. It's always kind of nice and loose and you have a, a good edge quality. You definitely, um, you know, I really love like the transparency you're seeing in here and in here um, compared to the, you know, more opaque and thick brushwork. And also here's something that I would ask for everybody to kind of look at this painting is look at the trunk, how it's not just, you know, solid, solid forms that they're kind of broken, they kind of disappear, reappear, um, and the thickness changes and everything else. It feels much more naturalistic that way. Also that as a general rule, they start a little bit wider or thicker towards the base and then get thinner as they branch out and up. Um, and for the most part, trees do that. Um, and it just will feel better to the viewer, like the trees doesn't want to topple over or it didn't grow in an interesting, unfortunate way. Um, yeah, so tell me a little bit about this. How did you, you, you said this was out of your head, which I like to call brain air um, instead of plain air. Yeah, I heard that when I was in California one time. Um, so tell me a little bit about that. How did you come about this scene? And uh, yeah, what, were, what was your thought process here? Okay, I, I don't do very many vertical paintings. I do horizontal paintings to the point of boredom when I put together a collection. So every once in a while, I do a vertical painting. This particular composition, I've used variations on this composition several times. Um, I enjoy it. I find it a very quiet, calming composition. Um, sometimes I put cattle in it. Sometimes I don't. Um, that's, that's about it. It's just a pleasing, calming composition. Absolutely. And there's a nice balance without being overly balanced. Um, you know what I mean? The painting doesn't feel like it's leaning one way or the other. Um, yeah, it reads really well. And I like your kind of the creek and the tall grasses so that you're not seeing the creek completely. Um, yeah, I really like it. Um, do you have any questions on it at all or? No, I, I will work on it. I'll probably work on all of the paintings that we've done in the class in order to bring them to completion. But I may return to my old familiar palette. <laughs> of course, yep, that's absolutely okay. Well, fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing and uh, it's always nice to see one of your paintings. Thank you. Oops, sorry, I jumped too far ahead there. Linda, is this the final version here? Oops.
There it is. Okay, now we can see the full thing. Oh, I'm afraid you're muted, Linda. Now, can you hear me? Yep. I, I hopefully I will be able to soften by adding some just um, very thin uh, layer of white to touch the ground right here. I have softened it somewhat, but then everything was turning green and I didn't want it to all be green because the whole thing when it hit the ground, sometimes when it hails out here, it'll look like this with streaks like of ice just falling. But um, I don't know. I, I, I lost, you guys, I got hacked a week ago um, today, like at 4.30 in the afternoon, and my husband hadn't saved all of my photos. So I've lost everything. And I just had to, I don't know, it's something I took. I don't know where I found this one, but uh, I don't know. I found it somewhere in the archives of the old site. And it took a week for me to get my Facebook back up again. But I didn't get any of my paintings, my family pictures. Oh, my God. What with me? But this was one that I saw. And it this sky with all of these, the sky does this out here all the time with these streaks of white and gray and purple and yellow. And I did my best for what I could do after being so stressed all week about this being hacked. Well, hopefully uh, you were able to uh, step away while you were painting and uh, uh, enjoy it and not worry too much about all the other things. And um, yeah, it's it. there's so much nice, so many great things going on in this painting. Um, it's, uh, I love, I mean, it really feels like what you were describing, just the kind of a burst of all of a sudden, just moisture, rain, hail, whatever it is, uh, kind of coming down. It's interesting that it's so precise, like it's just like comes down in one small area. Um, I think it wouldn't feel so much like that if it wasn't so close to us on the ground. It okay. really feels like it's within about 20 yards of us um in distance it was it was it, it when when i watch it rain i'll watch it maybe like 20 miles away and as it creeps across the desert i'll take different photographs of it and this is how it looks when it get up close gets up close to you just it's crazy it'll just like rain like there's a funnel or something dropping water on the earth that is so interesting yeah here it just covers everything <laughs> it's oh. <just> rain everywhere <laughs> um, you know Moisture dries up so fast here that, you know, the sun behind all of these clouds, it's working like the Dickens just to dry all that rain up on us, you know. We don't get a lot of rain out here. So when I when we see rain out here, everybody goes out and celebrates the rain. <laughs> <laughs> it's raining. So what if we get wet, you know, and, and you just you watch it and we all take pictures of it. But sometimes it is so purple and then having yellow and just the reflection of the desert bush will be green in the sky, you know, in the colors. And, That's really and I try to capture that. Really interesting. Yeah, uh, beautifully done. Uh, it really does feel like what you're describing. Um, if for a little bit of feedback here, uh, your clouds on the sides are both kind of leaning in towards it, which maybe happens. I Again, it's not a, a weather um phenomenon I'm very familiar with um but it, it kind of all leans in and then the fact that your rain cloud there which definitely becomes the focal point I mean it's almost hard to look away from it here yeah uh, is pretty centered right down the middle oh my goodness <laughs> um so I think if you kind of diffused it maybe a little bit but you know so it could be really yeah. thick, but a little bit softer off to maybe one side or the other um, might help that a little bit. Um, okay. Otherwise, really nice. I mean, it definitely just feels like a lot of moisture just falling out of the sky all of a sudden in this kind of interesting one little space. Well, so, and some, sometimes it's sweet. It's it's like the clouds are at like an angle, and it's raining in that spot. And I've seen it right in my like on my little three acres here. It's 
it'll rain and it'll you can see the gray the gray or the white or the purple looking clouds coming down and it's just raining on the back end of the lot and i and i can't even it's not raining at the house you know like right. it's raining 200 feet back and not right here on us yeah yeah i mean we get that here where you can watch the rain slowly from off in the distance and it comes and then it's kind of fun to be in the front of the house and run to the back of the house and go it's running raining in the front not in the back and you know i know it's so crazy so interesting um yeah so i don't want this to be a don't do it uh what i'm going to tell you next because okay. it's fun and you should always paint what you want but I do find when I find like really odd rock formations or trees that are just growing so very strangely or anything uh really really odd sunsets that you just can't look away from because you've never seen anything like it um uh, sometimes really interesting things like that um are tough to paint because yeah. they just odd things look doubly odd as a painting um, you know, it, it looks sometimes a little bit like a mistake. And I'm not saying that about this because, again, mm -hmm. you're living in a completely in, in different environment. And I'm sure all of your neighbors will be like, holy cow, I saw that, you know, a month ago. It's so weird when that happens and amazing and beautiful. Um, but I am hesitant. I have lots of photos where, you know, I'm so excited because I see this strange, odd occurrence like we get this weird dome on top of Mount Hood here in Portland, where it looks like a UFO is just parked on top of the mountain. I've seen and I always take a photo. I will literally pull over every time I see that and take photos, but I've never painted it because it looks so odd, like a little hat just sitting <laughs> on top of Mount Hood or literally a UFO parking on top of Mount Hood. Um, and so that's my only thing that I'm, you know, I maybe would ask a little bit when you're painting things. But again, this is something that's not strange to you. It's something that you see regularly and that people in your uh, part of the world would mm -hmm. definitely appreciate and enjoy. And I think you did a really nice job with it. I think it is a... And another strange phenomena out here, these bushes are all across the desert, the smaller ones are creosote bushes and they get bushy, they, they'll get six feet tall and they all grow in a line. You can look out and there'll be like a row, just rows of these things. They grow like, I don't know if you guys, trees trees actually nurture each, each other with uh, all kind of funguses and spores and stuff on, among their roots. And one tree will actually, an old tree will give its all of its substance to a younger tree that's trying to survive. So. These bushes have regenerated themselves for years and they're very old and there's like dead limbs all over, but they grow in these just autonomic kind of rows. They're just all over. And it's, that's very hard for me to, because I come from the swamp and, oh, you know, cypress trees in the water and moss hanging and the sun shining through it. And now I'm looking at desert, you know, so. Yeah. So I well, have mixed emotions about trying to recreate that. And, and I keep seeing a bayou and a, and a cypress tree, you know, but that's not what I see out here. But it, but that's what my mind gives me. So I'm I'm conflicted. You know? Yeah, absolutely. I think I told the story about going and painting, you know, in Arizona and stuff and just being able to all of a sudden see forever. Like everything was yeah. crystal clear. The mountains didn't seem to get bluer and cooler. You know, everything was just crystal clear forever. And it was almost discombobulating. Like I had such a difficult time trying to paint it because of my innate knowledge, or, you know, growing up in this area with fog all the time and, you know, all the different things that um, have become such a part of my painting and, paint, you know, and my knowledge of how the landscape and distance works. So yeah, it's so strange when you go to a new place, you know, you always hear people talking about the light in Italy is different and holy yeah. cow, if it isn't, it's just, it's just strange. Um, yeah, pretty fun. Anyways, I really appreciate you, Linda. And uh, this painting is really nice and it's fun to talk about uh, things well, that we here don't experience very often. Yeah, the light, the light in Louisiana is a lot like it is in Italy for some reason, something about 
placement on the earth or whatever the latitude longitude stuff yeah yeah i can imagine and, that's probably true yeah and it's it's foggy misty at times other time it, it's clear but then up north when i lived on the u.s canadian border it was totally different and then here it's like extremely different and these mountains are like 50 miles away but when it rains and the and the clouds move down to the earth here you can't see sometimes they're all obliterated they're just gone you can't see them and right. somebody somebody you suggested that i make them bluer and i did and i thank you whoever that was i don't know who said that to me one of the group here <laughs> yeah i think that definitely helped yeah i saw in your initial painting they're quite orangey peachy um, purple like yeah yeah, which could happen if it was more sunset feeling, but this definitely doesn't quite feel like, you know. No, it was mid-afternoon. Well, I used quinacridone red, cad yellow, pale, and um, ultramarine blue. And and I also used the 10 mother colors, the, the black and white. And so everything has a little black and white in it. Perfect. Yeah, and that definitely harmonizes it. Because, yeah, this painting could have been very broken into you know top and bottom but it definitely harmonizes pretty well so nice job on that thank you great all right i think we've seen this painting i'm just gonna jump around here maybe i'll scroll down here so yeah there's what the where the hills are pinker is this a different mm -hmm. painting it looks like things have moved around no it's the same painting but i went back and looked at the paint at the photograph and this cloud at the top wasn't so uh distinguished it was more uh just fuzzy so that's what i, I on the last one you looked at i just made it fuzzy on the yeah top. i mean in one way i kind of like this where this rain feels a little bit further off yeah uh, it feels a little more naturalist and it makes the funnel feel bigger yeah. when you bring it down so much all of a sudden it becomes smaller because it's so much closer right right uh, but yeah anyways okay thank you yep yep all right michelle how are you doing good it's my birthday today hey you're a busy girl yeah wow that's awesome happy birthday thank you so Everybody has to be nice to Michelle today. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so this was, uh, I was trying to um, do this for my homework, as well as the OSA was doing a 12 by 12 that I jumped in on at the end um, that the, it starts, the show actually starts tomorrow. And, um, and I'm just, do, I just did it because I wanted to challenge myself to, to just, it, there's, um, I think it's Bob Goff has something called the inciting incident where when you want to do something, you have to, you have to do something that will make you do it. And so this class is one of those things. And, and that show was another where it just kind of forces me, compels me to do what I want to do anyway, which is to try painting. And um, this one, I started with Indian yellow, earth red, and Payne's blue with titanium white. Um, but then I ended up at bringing in a little quinacridone red and manganese blue hue. And Michael, when I first showed you it and you said you liked it and, and um, I just went back and messed with it and I wish I hadn't, um, but there's, there's nice things about this one as well as the original one, which was just, I tend to overwork things. And that's something I, I need to really work on is is just leave it alone like you said and step back for a while and and um live with it for a bit um so yeah it doesn't feel overworked to me at all um i don't see that and i actually do think i like what you've done here more than the original um there's more it just has more feeling the colors really play well together with the cools in the sky and the warms in the ground um yeah, and nice job. I also like your signature, a little heart in there. That's pretty good. It's a it's a M with a weird little stylized F underneath it. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. It looks like a heart. Um, I'll have to work on that. No, no, I like it. Um, and really nice. I, I I think the painting has a really great feel. It feels kind of old world or timeless, 
Um, I love the little bit of kind of the idea of some rain kind of, you know, not quite hitting the ground, but we've seen that where it's up in the sky, maybe uh, evaporates before it hits the ground. Um, it, this painting definitely has kind of an emotional re resonance to it. Um, it's calming, it's nice, but there's just enough movement and action to make it interesting and not, you know, too overly still or boring. Um, yeah, uh, even though it's your birthday, I'm going to be a little bit mean to you. Um, your, uh, if I didn't notice the sun right here, I actually would not think that's where the sun was in this painting. I would actually think it's probably off to the left somewhere and that this is the light striking across the ground here. Maybe from one side, probably this side, I guess. Um, even the trees feel, well, I mean, it still works. The only thing is, is that um, these would probably have some kind of shadows if the sun was here. Um, not too bothersome. It looks beautiful and it works as an artistic piece, but that's just kind of a, you know. Um, Good point. But that's it. I really like the uh, ver variety and variation of edge quality throughout. You know, you've got some crisper edges, a lot of diffused uh, edges. Um, you've got some really uh, thin and almost transparent paint and some opaque paint, which really always for me is a nice challenge to get them to read and play together well. Um, yeah, I would love to uh, throw this one out to the uh, audience here, to our fellow students and ask you guys what you think of this one and what little feedback here. How about you, Karen? Let's hear from you. I saw you just popped in there. Michael, can I say something? Sure, Karen, you're still muted. Yep, go ahead, Michelle. Uh, when I brought it in, um, the, the people who took it in, um, you know, liked it. And then they said, have you taken any classes from Michael Orwick? That's great. Yeah, it definitely has a feeling of uh, the kind of paintings I like to do, for sure. It makes you feel really peaceful you know I feel like the end of the day you've had a great day and this is a great finish for the day absolutely absolutely yeah it's a painting that could go anywhere um you know and just be a nice uh accompaniment to you know a well-decorated home so nice piece Thank all you. right Karen, you're not to... off the hook. oh go ahead Meryl oh I just wanted to toss in that yeah I I really love the kind of contrast between that cool. Did you say Payne's blue or Payne's gray? I'm sorry, Payne's, Payne's gray. Um, yeah, I, I love that contrast between the cool gray, you know, that cool gray blue in the sky and then kind of the warm oranges. It, it to me, it's very Pacific Northwest where you kind of, in autumn where you get these warm colors but then like the wintry sky is just starting to bump up against them Ooh, I, nice. yeah yeah that the mood of the painting is really to me it's like a little bit bittersweet um i think rick rick made it sound like like the end of a good day that's what it's like it's like kind of the end the end of the slightly warm weather and yeah it's it the tone of it is very beautiful yeah it is kind of like the the end of autumn the beginning of winter starting to encroach yeah. And I love the textures you've put in your shadows. I like looking into those and seeing little nuggets, little fun things to look at, even in the darks. Yeah, it's a reward for looking deeper into the painting. That's, uh, yeah, well played. Yeah, that little, just the hint of a trunk in here and different things like that. You can see the branches at the base of this. And that just shows that you've gone a little bit above and beyond, you know, just uh, taking your value structure and playing it up. And then, yeah, I, I always, uh, that's one thing that always hurts me in paintings is when they don't use the shadows because there's so much beauty in our shadows um, if we just look a little bit deeper. So yeah, nice, good feedback. 
Thank Great. you. Yeah, happy birthday. All right. All right, Karen, we're back to you. So I'm going to go to where your grouping was, even though actually let's look at this one because it's so cool. All right. Um, I'll let you go ahead and lead us off, Karen. Oh, I just I, I feel like I haven't really turned in much homework. And um, so I just wanted to show like I'm I, I keep taking little things that you're saying about just technique and I keep going off on these very simple exercises, but I still think it's helpful. I know that you say all the time that everything in painting is about big shapes and values. So I'm still I still feel like I'm just kind of in preschool playing with those rules, but it's fun. Absolutely. I mean, this is this is something I will find myself doing all the time. Uh, like when I just have a pen or pencil and a piece of paper, like sitting on an airplane or even just while we're watching TV, you know, and if there's just a notepad by all of a sudden I just end up with a couple circles and then all of a sudden there's spheres and then I see how they interact. And uh, yeah, it's an exercise I go back to over and over and over. I remember doing this for the first time in high school and um and just being so amazed, uh, you know, I'd already learned about, you know, turning a square into a cube in middle school and stuff. And I always thought that was just so neat, you know, making things look three dimensional. And then all of a sudden you could take a circle and by just adding, a, you know, value shifts to it, turning it into a sphere, uh, it was just kind of a magic to me. I just, I, I mean, I still remember that feeling of just discovering that or not discovering it, but being showed it and uh, shown it. And it is just, it's, and it's so useful. I mean, we can see this becoming a bush and a tree and a figure's, you know, a person's head and everything else. There's just so much to learn from just doing spheres or shapes of any sort. Um, and yeah, and then I think I commented, yeah, just this little bit right here is so magic. Uh, just a little bit of reflected light on the uh, tabletop surface is really nice. So well done. Thank uh, you. Yeah, I want to go to your little grouping. I'm going to skim across. Where did they go? There's another one. There's another one. All right. Well, I guess I'm doing them one at a time. Um, yeah, this is a great exercise. And this is something I've actually contemplated having students do. And maybe, boy. I got to figure out how I would do it. And I would love to do something like this in our color class um, where you actually paint three, you know, get three blocks um, and paint them various colors. And just to watch what happens when, you know, you got your direct sunlight here, a little less, a little more diffuse. This is kind of a, you know, bouncing around light and then into the shadow and then the cast shadow. And then you've got even a nice little penumbra here around the edge of the shadow and the light. And um, yeah, it's such a great exercise. Um, East Coast painters would take these outside, the blocks of color and paint them. Um, it's, it's something I've never done. I should really challenge myself to do that. Um, and uh, so maybe that's what I'll do is make a number of cubes, see where I can find some cubes and paint them up. Um, because it is, it's a wonderful, wonderful exercise um, just to see what happens. And then just, you know, in here, you're just dealing with black, white, and the value scale, the grays. And uh, I'm sure that this was not easy to get all the different varieties. Um, is this partly pencil and partly paint? I was playing with charcoal for the first time. <laughs> so... I haven't quite figured out how to blend it and stuff yet. That's but. all right. Is it all? I mean, like these solid surfaces, they look like almost like paint. So after that lesson, um, I took my um, value scale. I have like a little 10 value scale with little holes in it. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to identify the value on each surface and then trying to replicate just zoning in. So I did it on toned paper and I played with graphite and then charcoal, just seeing if I could get all the 10 values. Wow. So just playing. What a challenge. What a challenge. So yeah, I'm sure. And again, we can definitely see 
in each one of those, imagine if this was more of a, you know, a bush shape or a mountain or anything else that, or rocks, definitely, right? You're going to get, you know, they're a three-dimensional shape in each one of those who just, you know, looking for their irregularities if it was an organic shape or a rock or whatever. Um, so these lessons are super valuable and I'm thrilled that you, uh, you know, we're able to incorporate some of the things we've been talking about as far as value structure and uh, things like that and turn it into something very useful. And hopefully, yeah, I think these will be really great. I hope you, you hang on to these, put them up in your uh, painting area, your giant studio, I'm sure. And <laughs> just take the kids art off the fridge and hang them up there. <laughs> um, very nice. Anybody else want to add anything to uh, this? And we'll keep going on because she's got a couple others here. I'm I'm just astounded and marveled at all of those. I've I haven't done anything like that. I'm still such a beginner, but just like this one here, it's just the the textures and it's just uh, I just marveled at them. I looked at them for a long time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, well, you even use Marvel in your uh, your comment over here. Um, yeah, this is so fun because it, you know, even at a quick glance, or even when it was just a little thumbnail on Facebook, I was completely aware of what type of fabrics or materials these were. You know, the soft and fluffy blanket, and then the more uh, more like a sweater material and then more of just a smooth almost like a sheet or something like that um but you can really feel the texture and the material in this um and again <laughs> if we take this to the landscape you know you've got your grasses you've got your you know smooth areas you've got your you know different types of things that Texture really lets us know so much about what it is we're looking at. Um, so yeah, tell us a tiny bit about this one. Um, just the things you said, just playing with textures, because you keep talking about this language of grass and it just makes me aware that I haven't um, observed it as much. So I was trying to get in just on like a little tiny thing in my house when I couldn't get outside to see if I could capture some of that language. But it get you out of folding laundry for a little while. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> That's my life. <laughs> Even though you gave me just permission. Like, I can't not fold to do this. I'm drawing it. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it's interesting that like, um, light seems to be very obedient to its rules. Like there's there's a landscape in the fabric um, of different planes, diagonals and uprights. And it was fun to just see that consistency. Yeah, boy, that almost gives me ideas of like, if we put a, you know, did a still life, but set up your, you know, drop some clothes, throw a couple objects on top of it, you know, and then pick a single light source, you know, and just see what happens would be a really interesting way to show form and structure and different textures. So anyways, uh, yeah, um, you know, I've got to fail you because you didn't follow the assignment at all. But uh, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's wonderful. I really enjoyed seeing it. Um, and I really appreciate your sharing it because I think we can all learn a lot from observing uh, all of this. So anyways, um, I think you were kind of uh, a little rough on yourself about not having time and not doing things, but these are all fantastic. And I think, um, you know, I like to think that once you can paint something, you can paint anything that it's, you know, there are different rules and there's different, you know, things that nature kind of observes, but truthfully, an object is an object values are values and light is light and just observing it and all of its different, you know, outdoors, indoors, um, you know, with indoors, you might have multiple light sources and it becomes a little trickier that way. Um, so if you are going to do a still life in the beginning, I often will suggest that students, you know, maybe put it inside of a box or, you know, in a darker room that doesn't have, you know, three windows and 10 overhead lights or, you know, an area that you can control the light and then set up a single light source. 
um, is a great tool, especially for the long months. And then the other neat thing is if you're intending to be, you know, a plain air painter, doing a couple of still lifes kind of quickly is a great way to prepare yourself for getting out to do plain air painting. Um, but the neat thing is, is that you can revisit it. You know, you just go turn that light back on and, uh, you know, you've got a much slower work time than you do when you're actually out doing plain air painting. So well played, well played. All right. Uh, I don't think, let me scroll through here. I don't think Kathleen was able to join us this week which is too bad because I had nothing but compliments for her this week. Um, so she only shows up when I want to be mean to her, unfortunately. Um, Kathleen has been a student of mine off and on for quite some time, and it has been a true uh, honor and treat to watch Kathleen's hard work uh, really showing through. Um, she is a retired school teacher and uh, it's uh, we've actually had conversations about the teaching process and about giving feedback and about uh, taking in lessons. And I just think she, you know, is amazing. She should teach a class on how to be a student because she's just so good about taking in information and working it and working it and working it. And uh, anyways, Kathleen. When you watch this video, uh, I really appreciate your diligence and hard work and persistence. And uh, I think I said it in one of the comments. I think this is one of my favorite paintings um, that I've seen of yours thus far. I think it's really nice. It's got a gorgeous harmony. The edge quality is really nice. Um, it's got movement. Uh, yeah, I just, uh, anyways, it's a, it's a, it's a treat to see, uh, to watch people grow and to watch people challenge themselves. And, uh, you know, a lot of times when we're challenging ourselves, it's two steps backwards so that we can take a couple steps forward. So, you know, just know that I know that. <laughs> um, I've told the story in past classes about me taking workshops. I still take workshops and classes um, every year, um, both to learn, you know, how other people are teaching and to challenge myself in trying other techniques. And something I discovered, boy, a long time ago now, my daughter was three years old, so 15 years ago, taking a workshop. And I so badly wanted to impress the instructor. He was a hero of mine. And uh, I, I, I was playing it safe. And I wasn't learning as much as I should. And because I was too afraid to fail in, his, in front of him. And, you know, luckily it was a full week long workshop of long, long days and long hours. And it was about midway through where I kind of came to that realization of, for one, I wasn't going to impress him. <laughs> and for two, that, um, that it, what, that's not why I was taking the workshop. I was there to learn, to study and to try new things. And, um, you know, nobody wants a painting that doesn't work out, but we can learn so very much from those struggles. And um, so anyways, all that being said is, um, you know, I'm praising Kathleen for a successful, beautiful painting here. Don't worry, I'm not expecting that. I, I expect a lot of trial and tribulation, which is gonna lead to, you know, less than successful paintings. And then the reminder there is that every painting is for the next painting, right? Just keep remembering that, that this painting is all about the next painting. And that painting is about the painting after that. And so hopefully we're just learning, not always improving, but always learning. So anyways, beautifully done, great color harmony. I mean, even though it's primarily in greens and grays, it feels like there's a lot of interest in this and a lot, you know, it's, it's yeah, beautiful. Anybody else wanna say anything about Kate's painting real quick before I go away here? She's saying that her uh, camera even though she took the pictures back to back, how different they are. And yeah, I know <laughs> iPhones are funny and uh, taking pictures on our phones is always a struggle. I, I Carol, think her, 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 her work is beautiful. Yeah, it's really nice. Yeah, Good space within to, for the eye to travel. Yeah, and look at this big quiet area. Like 
in my instinct, just put your hand up and cover the whole right side. You know, that quiet side, just put your hand up and cover it. And I would have almost edited it just to be the left part of the painting, but I really like the right side. And it's an interesting balance. That's not something I would think would work really well, but it does. And it gives our eyes interest and place to, you know, explore and then an area to rest. Exactly. And, and the fog up in the upper left corner over the, the hill there also mm -hmm. is just, um, makes you look at it and and feel it and then move back to the right yeah and this lost edge up here for it yeah. serves two purposes for one it's gorgeous and so subtle but the other thing is is look what it does it kind of when we have soft edges like this it's basically telling our brain don't worry about this too much it's not too important. She's giving us just enough information to let us know what's going on. But what it does is just what Michelle said. So it takes us to here. And then this brings us back over to here. And we get this nice little loop. You know, maybe she could have done a little something here to kind of make a little bit of a circular shape. But I mean, I don't see that as really necessary. Just there's a nice movement. It's got interest, but at the same time, a, a space for us to relax. All right, I saw this painting before and it is much better now, in my opinion. Um, if I remember right, you had the purples, gray. Yeah, it was a, yeah, kind of a lilac color and it just didn't look like it fit with the rest of it. Beautiful. Thank you so much for revisiting this and doing some changes. And uh, yeah, it's got a nice harmony to it. Uh, even with the warms and the cools right beside each other, it still reads really well. Those colors go nicely together. They play well together. And that dynamic color between purples and yellows, you know, those they're opposite on the color wheel. Right. Um, so it should be super like bang, but because of the subtler values and it's a subtle purple, it's not, you know, a fluorescent bright purple. Right. Um, it really works well. Yeah. Thank you for revisiting that. What do you think? Could you uh, feel yeah, like yeah. you're. Yeah. After you told me about it, it, it looked obvious that, you know, it just did not work before. And so I went back over with the oil. You can see little hints of it off to the right, but uh, of that strip, yeah, of, of the lilac or the purplish. But yeah, I think it looks way better now. Thank All you. Right. Yeah, my pleasure, thank you. And so was this the painting before what we saw earlier? Or is this the newest version? So I thought it was two different paintings. Oh, sorry, Rick, it's muted again. Oops, nope, you're still muted. <laughs> Anybody good at reading lips? Sorry, Rick. Got it. Oh, uh, I, put, I put more colors in the sky after the, this was the first version I did after the underpainting. Great, I mean, it's still beautiful. I, I There's so much to enjoy here, but I definitely like where you ended up with it. Um, yeah, nicely done. Thank and you can see you're already, you're already starting to, uh, you know, you've established your values and you're really kind of keeping within them already, even at the beginning stage of this painting. Um, I think that's why it's holding together so well at all the different stages. And do you have the black and white of it as well? Uh, no, that I have a black and white of the Yenchi River. Uh, this is the underpainting here. Oh, okay, great. So that would kind of be like the black and white. So this is where you're establishing your shapes and your values and your stuff. Right. Great. And then we get up to there and you're building it up. And then you got to where we, uh, the final version that we saw earlier. Right. Great. Am I missing anybody else here? Uh, Michelle, was this one, this one's from a while that back. That was right? from before the previous. Great. Okay. Yeah. And then Richard has one more. Um, I, I don't think we need to talk about it too much. I saw you got quite a bit of feedback on this one. Your black right. and white underpainting, um, the Yang Si here. Uh, yeah, I think your structure in here is pretty good. 
Um, I see, you know, it's a pretty quick uh, kind of washy underpainting, which is great. Um, kind of just knocking it in. And then when you added your colors, where did that guy go? Um, I saw that it was pretty yellow. It was horrible. Yeah, I don't want to beat up on it too much. Um, I'll just point out one thing. Here we go. Right, there it is, yeah. Um, I, yeah, I didn't know going in what, what I was going to do, and I just kind of threw that in there, and it's like, oh, that was really bad. <laughs> um, uh, I think the main thing that's happening here is you go from a kind of a cool purpley browns in here to really quite warm, almost acidy kind of colors. Right. And then back to cool, then back to warm, then back to cool. Um, I'm not sure where your light source is at all. Me either. Um, it, it was from a black and white photograph. And my wife and I were looking at trying to figure out where the light was coming from. And we couldn't figure it out. Yeah, so you see how important it is, right? Yeah. And, you know, and if it, if you don't have a strong light source, then you probably don't want to pretend there's one if you're not going to make it up and make right. it kind of obvious. So this feels kind of like there's a light source in some of it, and then other parts it doesn't. And I think that's what's happening is your uh, your temperatures are shifting back and forth. Right. Um, cold, warm, cold, warm, cold, neutral. Um, yeah. so yeah, yeah i could make up my mind and it's quite obvious <laughs> yeah i think you know figure out what your mother color is uh figure out what colors you want the palette to be and then just either start at the beginning and go back you know or start at the back and come forward whatever it is to establish your uh value structure and your and the values are working pretty okay again if we turn this back into a black and white i think it would probably read okay yeah. Um, but I, but that would be my quick and kind of obvious uh, feedback on that one. Right. Great. Okay, thank you. Perfect. All right. Well, that was one hour of uh, me um, really just being impressed, you guys. Nicely done. Um, yeah. Michael, uh, please. Uh, yeah, I... I've got one in there somewhere, and I'm, last week I put in one that I shouldn't have even put in, but I really wanted to hear about this week's. Okay, let's look for it real quick. Thank you for letting me know, Renita. Um, it's got trees coming in from both sides. And... This one? No, I don't even see it. No wonder you couldn't bring it up. Uh, do you have an opportunity maybe to uh, post it real quick? Uh, yeah, maybe. Hang Let's on go because... ahead and take a quick break. I'm going to go warm up my ice cold, sad coffee here. <laughs> Drinking out of a uh, Pyrex <laughs> measuring glass. Um, and uh, let's take a quick break. And uh, oops, man, this camera wants to fall. Um, and, uh, I will set up at the easel a little bit. I've base, I'm pretty well set up. I just need to get my paints out, um, onto the side palette. So let's go ahead and take a 10 minute break. That hopefully will give Renita a chance to, uh, find her, uh, picture, maybe post it. Um, and if not Renita, we can always come back to it at, at the end of the class as well. If you need a little more time to get that established. Oh, and then, yeah, just to share, um, kind of an odd painting that I'm working on there. Um, I just really wanted to play with just uh, different shapes of trees and um, uh, a little bit of sense of depth and kind of using kind of what we were talking about, Rick, is the trees as framing devices a little bit, um, but I'm having fun with that one. And then I've got a very colorful Cannon Beach picture way back there. Um, yeah, let's take a break and I'm gonna stop the recording. 